Hey guys, welcome back to Ashley's Homestead Adventures. I did want to just kind of pop in here. A good friend of mine uh, mentioned to me that I probably should make a chicken video. One of the reasons is, is uh, I'm doing my own chicken math. Uh, I was just doing my own chicken math yesterday. I just ordered my chicks from Murray McMurray. Um, I have ordered from Jinx uh, in the past. Jinx is actually in Oregon. Uh, so it, it was closer to us in the past. Uh, I've had wonderful, wonderful luck with Jinx. I love them. Um, and now I've switched over to Murray McMurray. They're extremely helpful over the phone uh, in helping me choose the best chickens for my new climate that I'm learning. And uh, so I did go ahead and I ordered 25 chicks from them and then I'm also going to resource some um, locally Whoa. from another farm here. Hey, I'm trying to make a video. For some reason when I start talking, the kids think it's time to start playing. Um, so I'm gonna go through just a couple things. I'm not an expert on chickens. I have had chickens for the last 11 years. So I do know some of the breeds well. I know what works for me and I'm more than happy to share that. And so the first thing is, is obviously it's good to buy from good hatcheries. Um, a lot of the things that I'm gonna tell you are opinions. Um, for instance, I like to grow my meat as organically as I possibly can. Uh, I like, however I like, I believe in grain. Um, I'm not a, um, I'm not an anti-grain person. I'm not a strictly grass-fed person. I actually am not a fan of grass-fed meat. Uh, for just personal, I don't like the taste of it. So all of my opinions moving forward in this will be, you know, based off of some of that knowledge. Um, my chicks usually come from a hatchery at first. If I'm getting a new breed uh, or f this spring I'm, I'm getting uh, chickens for the first time in Arkansas. So I, you know, instead of resourcing from just strictly backyards and locally uh, because we are in rural America, I wanted to go ahead and get pure bred breeds. And it took me a long time to decide because I know the breeds that I love, but I also know all the cool fancy breeds, you know, the Polish and with the big fuzzy heads and the Arcanas with the cute fuzzy cheeks and the beards. And you know, it's you get a hold of a chicken catalog and it's, it's, it's hard to not over order. Uh, but what I will tell you as far as breeds go, the ones that I know and what I like or dislike about them, I am a huge Bard Rock fan. Now there is um, Plymouth Bard Rock, you have red bards, you have white bards. Uh, there's, there's different kinds of, of Plymouth, like sometimes they call them Plymouth Rock, sometimes they call them Bard Rock, uh, but the original Plymouth Bard Rock is the one that I really, really love. Um, there, you know, the, the gray or white speckled with black um, on each feather. So each feather is, the plumage is white on the inside and it's got a black ring around the whole outside. And it, so it creates kind of this um, flea-bitten, speckled, mottled chicken. Um, every feather is almost identical and so it just really creates a really pretty marble looking chicken. Um, I love them because they are a heavy breed. They're a hardy breed. Uh, they have always worked for me in cold climates. They, in Oregon, they were tough as nails. I'll get into some of the other, you know, things later as far as why they're tough as nails, but they, you know, they're good in the heat, they're good in the cool, and in general, when you're going to buy your chickens, when you're looking at them and you're trying to decide what breeds are going to work for you, for beginners, they say that the heavier breeds are the best way to go because they are the hardiest. They are, in general, better in heat 
better in cold, better with parasite pressure, um, good, you know, uh, foragers, really good egg layers. Um, you know, in, in general, your, your egg layers are going to be the, the darker the color of the egg, the longer that it's, it's going to take to produce it. So for instance, if you have a, let's put a, a, a barred rock next to a copper moran. Your morans have those really beautiful, dark chocolate eggs. They're gorgeous. And your barred rock has your, you know, light cream, tan, beige egg. The morans have a lower egg production because it takes them longer to create and pass the egg, which creates more pigment on the egg. So the longer that it's actually in the track, the darker the egg. And so therefore you're gonna get less eggs out of something like a copper moran than you are a barred rock. Uh, barred rocks are, I believe, number two, number one or number two, as far as a dual purpose breed. So they are a good meat chicken. They are a good egg chicken. Now, I like to have the trifecta. They're also just a really friendly, good chicken. Uh, I find that my, as far as my roosters go, I find that 80% of the time, the roosters do not get aggressive after a year old. That's a big deal to me because we don't, we have a very low tolerance for mean animals on our farm. Um, we have a lot of people that come and go. We have a lot of farm tours and I just, I have no tolerance for a mean rooster. Um, so I love the Bard Rocks for that. I love them for their personality. Uh, they're just, they're awesome. Another breed that we really love, we love Rhode Island Reds. Uh, good egg production, nice, um, you know, brown tan egg. And their, their sorrel or red in color, good in the heat, good in the cold. Um, I just don't, I'm just not, it's not that I don't like them as a breed, they're just not as pretty to me. And I love beautiful things, so the Rhode Island Reds are a very good production chicken. Um, they, they are also dual, dual purpose breed. Uh, you can use them for meat or for egg production, uh, but they're just not, they're not my favorite chicken because they just, they're just not as, I don't know, beautiful as the Bard Rocks are. Um, other chickens that I have had, I've had Delawares, love Delawares. Uh, they're very cool with their, you know, white body and then they have their, uh, their collar or their, their ring, the, the black ring around their necks and the black little tips on their wings. They're absolutely beautiful chicken. Another heavyweight breed, in my experience, extremely durable, very, very cold tolerant. Uh, buff Orpingtons, any Orpington really. I find that the buffs generally are bigger than all of the rest of them in my experience, but I haven't owned all of them. Um, I've had Buff Orpingtons, Black Orpingtons, and Lavender Orpingtons. I find that the Lavender Orpingtons are the daintiest of the three breeds that I've owned, um, but the buffs are just, they call them the golden retrievers of chickens. They are just friendly, docile, great with kids, um, another dual purpose breed, meat, eggs, heavy layer, uh, just a good overall, overall chicken. Well, get up here if you want to get up here. Just a good overall chicken. I have owned, uh, silver laced wine dots or wine dots. Um, I have owned, I've, I've, I've owned red wine dots, um, silver laced. I think blue laced. Um, anywho, the the wine dots or wine dots, depending on. I say wine dots, which I know that's wrong. It's just it's one of those weird things I do is say things wrong. Wine dots are uh, they're absolutely gorgeous, hardy, uh, decent egg layers, and you know good for good for me as well. 
and just and just absolutely beautiful. Personalities are great. Uh, they tend to be squatters. You know, if you run up to them to catch them, they tend to squat down and so easy, easily catchable. Uh, do love them. They're just not as high on the list of egg production as I would like. Uh, but I would definitely own them again. I have owned um, Aracanas, and Aracanas is kind of where my chicken math goes sideways because I, I love them for their blue eggs. I love them for their colors and their puffy, cute little cheeks. They look like like chipmunk chickens. And I love that. They're, they're beautiful birds. Um, a lot of my Aracanas or the barnyard mixes that have come from an Aracana line have been, the roosters especially, have been stunning. Mm -hmm. Hey, again, I'm trying to record a video here. You guys have your time. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, the thing, I love their blue eggs. I would say, you know, very productive in their first two years of life, but they do really go downhill. Um, no, don't touch the camera. Uh, they do go downhill, I would say, a little quicker than some of the larger breeds. They are a, you know, a smaller, finer chicken. Um, from what I have heard, they do really, really good in the south. Um, they do really, really good in heat. Mine all did fine in um, in the cold in Oregon. But the reason why I, I do not like them um, is because they are, they never really lose that wild streak. They're, in my experience, they're harder to handle. They're harder to catch. Um, and they're, they're really good jumpers, fairly good, you know, flyer gliders. I know that chickens can't fly, but, uh, you know, technically, uh, but as far as jumping over six foot tall fences, they have no problem with that, even with clipped wings. And then the chase is on. And when you're like me and you're a gardener and you're a farmer, you're a homesteader, you can't have six or eight Aracana chickens going through your tomato patch. It's just not okay. Uh, whether they're giving you blue eggs or not, if I don't have any tomatoes, I'm not a happy girl. So, long story short, I, I love the breed for their beauty, for their eggs, um, but I do not like them as far as maintaining them in a fenced area during the garden season. Um, as well as their friendliness to when people visit your farm, if you have kids, they are not a personable chicken, in my opinion. Uh, I think that that pretty much runs through, oh, I've had, um, I've had sex links, I've had black, I've had um, golden, and they're just a, you know, fair to midland chicken. I wouldn't say they're a heavy breed and I wouldn't say that they're a light breed. Uh, they're kind of somewhere in the middle. They're usually pretty plain Jane as far as their color goes. They lay eggs fine, but it's not a huge production. Uh, and they're just kind of boring to me. So um, not super personable. I wouldn't say mean, but uh, I've never had a rooster. The only roosters I have had, um, Easter Egger or the Blue Egg Laying Aracana background barnyard mix roosters. I have had um, Rhode Island Red Roosters, which I think I've had four total in my chicken career and all four of them turned mean. Uh, and I have had Barred Rock Roosters and like I said, 80% of the time they don't turn mean. So that's just my experience. I'm not like a, I don't have hundreds of chickens. The most chickens I've ever had at one time I think is not including a batch of meat chickens. I'm talking about my egg layers here. Um, I've had uh, 36 was my highest number. Um, so there's my breeds that I'm experienced with. Barb Rock wins hands down. 
Now you can get into, um, if you get a catalog from Murray McMurray or whoever your hatchery is, you can get into the conservation of breeds, which I think is a beautiful thing for people to do. But, uh, and it's something that I, every time I go to order chicks, I think, oh, I could do that. But fact of the matter is, is if you're running a homestead and you're not going to dedicate space, time, and money into preserving that breed, then don't look at it as a conservation thing and, and or a money maker. Look at it as just any other homestead chicken and that they're beautiful. You're gonna pay more money for them. And if the beauty is worth it to you, then that is awesome. Uh, but having them and putting them in our coops with our other breeds of chickens is not going to conserve that breed. You're just going to create barnyard mixes. And which is fine. I'm not at all saying that that's not what I may do in the future. I just want people to understand when you get into the conservation of a breed of any animal, you're going to have to seclude it. You're going to have to potentially spend more money on it because a lot of them are um, breeds that may require more work to keep them alive. Um, and you're going to have to, you, you know, if one gets out and gets in with your other chickens, you can't save and incubate any eggs from that chicken or you can't call any of those chicks purebred. You know, so there's just kind of that little weight that hangs over you if you decide to do conservation, which I think is a beautiful, wonderful thing, and anybody that has more than one chicken coop and they can do that and they want to do it, then I'm rooting for you and I appreciate what you do. It's just not something for a normal homesteader like me. It's not worth the investment for me to go into conservation of a chicken breed. Um, now I did, so you know what I ordered, I did order 25 barred rocks from Murray McMurray Hatchery. And then because I love my colored eggs, I did get a barnyard mix uh, of Moran. And it's primarily Orpington, Bard Rock, and, oh, uh, Wyandotte. And in, you know, in the background of the geniality. I'm actually getting my local chickens from a woman who is conservation breeding a, a rare breed of chicken and they're absolutely gorgeous. They're called a Millie Floor and they are beautiful and she keeps her chickens separated. And I spoke with her in length last night about, excuse me, I wish you guys could see this. These two chocolate morsels causing trouble behind the camera. It's very distracting. Um, so they're Millie de Flores um, and they are absolutely gorgeous, but she did talk me out of it just by saying, you know, if you're gonna have your barnyard chickens and then have a conservation, you've got to make sure that your conservation chickens don't, you know. She went through it with me and just said, you know, for me, because it is my primary focus, it works out great. But for someone like you who has all of the other farm animals and you're having this huge garden, you know, it might be too much work for you. Um, so I'm going to let people that know it and that are doing it well continue, continue to do it. Um, but I do have these Moran slash barnyard mix uh, heavy weights. Uh, also, I have the eggs of those coming to me. We will incubate those and hatch those out. Uh, we do have an incubator and we will be doing more incubating in the future. I just kind of wanted to really get a guaranteed 20, you know, 25, 24 if we lose one from Murray McMurray that are purebreds um, so that I have my purebred Barties and so that I can continue to grow my flock from there. So um, I'm going to go over just a couple frequently asked questions. Uh, and one of those, you know, for beginners is always what kind of chicken should I get? And my answer to you is do your research. Obviously, you know, don't get a, um, a rare breed 
warm climate only chicken if you live in the north where it snows six months out of the year. It's probably not a good idea. Um, but, and also, you know, you can look at your, your parasite pressure. You can look at how good, what you're gonna do with them. Uh, and the main thing is that I try to get across to people is don't over math it. We call it chicken math. We don't call it chicken algebra. So don't overthink it. Chickens are hardy, darty animals. They want to live, they want to thrive, and they want to lay eggs. Um, most people overthink getting chickens. The main things that you need to think about when you're getting chickens is how, what you want them for. Do you want them for egg production? Do you want them for meat production? Do you want them for, um, uh, which by the way, I've done Cornish cross meat chickens for years. Uh, we are trying to get away from them, but they are a breed of chicken that I have had and we love them for the meat production, but they cannot reproduce and they do have, in my opinion, a high death rate. And because they are bred and modified to, um, get so big so fast they come with health issues and it's a personal decision that i'm trying to not not buy into that anymore is it easier yes is it uh faster yes but we are going to try to go to the dual purpose breeds to become more sustainable because the cornish cross cannot become a sustainable breed on your farm because they they can't reproduce so um you need to figure out, are you gonna have them in a coop, in a static coop, which is a standalone, doesn't ever move coop? Um, are you going to have them on pasture? Are you gonna have them in a chicken tractor? Uh, and there are different breeds that do better at different things. But again, I have never met a chicken in my life that doesn't wanna scratch. So, you know, if you're, if you're out on pasture, and you're worried about your chicken being a good pasture chicken. It might be, you know, not as big of a rock star as, you know, a barred rock or a buff Orpington at, you know, going through and foraging, but it's still gonna scratch and eat bugs. So um, you're, you wanna think about um, your, your lighting and your egg production. This is another big common question that I get. Uh, are you going to light, you know, imitation light your chickens in order to get more eggs through the winter? Chickens will generally shut down when they get less than, it, they say it's 10, but I find it's more like eight or nine hours of daylight. They, they do shut their egg production down uh, and you may only get you know, one egg every two or three days instead of one egg a day. Some chickens shut down more than others. Uh, you know, again, that's that's where you get your, when you're researching chickens, that's where you get your, your egg count. You know, I, I think a, a barred rock is something like 320 eggs a year or something. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But every chicken is going to slow down in the wintertime months. So, some people will choose to put a light or even a heat lamp inside their coop. I am not a believer in that. I did do it for years and it did work. Uh, but I have come to not appreciate giving my chickens a false sense of daylight. I want my girls to have a break in the winter time and I want them to have that break when their body tells them that it's appropriate to do so. I'm not making money off of my egg production. We're using it solely for the purposes of our farm. So they don't have to continue to produce an insane amount of eggs every day. So I allow my girls to go without artificial lighting in their coop at nighttime and allow their bodies to rest in the winter time. Um, heating, many, many people call me and text me and ask me about heating in chicken coops. I did do it in my beginning years of, of um, 
of having chickens, <clears throat> but I, I did burn a chicken coop down with a heat lamp. Uh, there's most of us farmers have that story. And so for the last several years, uh, I would say seven or eight years, we do not run a heat lamp. Uh, there are, they do have, you know, heat boards that you can buy. Uh, I don't find them necessary for large chickens. Um, your chickens don't need to be heated. Chickens are one of the very few animals that actually have the ability to draw the heat out of their legs. And that they, you know, when they get on their roost and they hunch down, that is what keeps them warm. They huddle together on their roost and they fluff up their feathers to create a their geothermal insulation. Um, and they, they don't they don't need heat. I have not lost a chicken to the cold since I quit using a heat lamp. One thing a heat lamp also can create, besides the threat of falling off wherever you've got it hanging and creating a huge fire and killing all your birds. Um, it will also create condensation and moisture and lack of ventilation is a chicken's biggest threat. Chickens are very prone to respiratory diseases. So having a heat lamp in a coop creates heat, which creates condensation, which creates a wet environment. And you do not want that with your chickens. For me, it's worse to have that than it is to have an unheated unlit chicken coop and uh, mine have all done perfectly fine without heat or artificial lighting. Uh, one thing I should touch on uh, that I do get a a lot of questions <coughs> is you know of course, do you free range your chickens um, and my answer to that is sort of my chickens in general will have full run of the property when the garden is not producing. When the garden is done and I put her to bed, the chickens run the roost. During the parts of the year where the garden is producing and I need to keep the chickens out of the garden, we choose to pasture graze our gardens or our chickens in chicken tractors on pasture. Um, and you can do that in many different ways. Mr. Wonderful has built me, I think, sorry, that's hazy with a squeaky toy. I think that Mr. Wonderful is on his fourth or fifth chicken tractor edition. So there's many, many different, um, you know, blueprints or PDFs that you can get into. Uh, Justin Rhodes has a really great one. Uh, that you can download and he his is really awesome because he itemizes everything that you need shows you how to build it um, Really really informational and great uh, We have built them out of PVC and chicken wire That works really well PVC <clears throat> uh, That works really well and just tarped it um, So you need to be aware of what you would like to do with your chickens and aware of the different things and, and consequences that your choice with your chickens might bring up. So for instance, if you have your chickens in a chicken tractor out on pasture and you have, you know, big animal predator pressure, you know, say you have coyotes or foxes, they, coyotes and foxes can tear through certain gauges of wire. Even raccoons can tear through certain gauges of wire or tarps. Uh, so you need to make sure that you build those chicken tractors with a heavy duty gauge wire cloth that these animals cannot penetrate to get to your chickens. Um, if you are going to, for instance, keep your chickens in a static coop, which is what most people do. Um, and I usually have you know, one or two of each. I usually have my grazing flock and then I have my static flock. Um, and static flocks are excellent for a lot of things. 
I love to use my static flocks for compost turning. You can pile up compost in their pen, let them turn it over for you and wheel it back out and into the garden. Um, I love to use them for, you know, making compost. So throw a whole bunch of scraps and everything in their pen and, you know, maybe deep bed them with some wood chips and let them turn all that stuff together and, and poo in it. And they have just made you a, you know, a good compost starter that you can then take out and let age. Um, I love them for, uh, you know, being mothers. Sometimes I will take my broody hens and I'll put them all in a static coop to where they can be moms in a safe environment. Um, static coops are great. One of the best advice that I can give you for static coops is good ventilation. And, and by good, I just mean that you need to have ventilation for more than just the hole in the chicken door. So if you have a, you know, a chicken door right on the front of your coop, then just make sure that you have a way to open a window. And that could just be a wood window. I'm not saying it has to be a full on glass window, but that you have a way to open a window or that you leave, um, you know, ventilation gaps in your roofing to where the, the heat and the condensation can get out of there. Um, and deep bedding. Deep bedding is a huge, huge, huge deal. Joe Salatin calls, Joel Salatin calls it a carbonaceous diaper. And by deep bedding your animals, you decrease that um, chance of the ammonia building up and you know, why not just deep bed them, let them be more comfortable, allow them to have that warmth, allow that deep bedding, whether it's straw, whether it's hay, whether it's uh, pine shavings, no matter what it is, allow that to absorb all of that stuff and that stuff not be floating up in the air around your chickens. Um, and just keep your coops clean. I mean, that's a no brainer. I do wanna tag on right here, do not use cedar wood chips for your chickens. Um, there's a lot of controversy going on, or not going on, but there's a lot of controversy if you research this about whether or not this is true, but I will tell you from my experience, I do believe that it is true. Uh, there are oils in cedar that actually cause upper respiratory infections in chickens, and I have indeed lost a couple chickens because I made that mistake and I put cedar bedding in their coop. Um, so my opinion, my advice, do not use cedar anything uh, for bedding for your chickens. Now I have had many coops built out of cedar wood and never had a problem. Um, but I do not use it for bedding for my chickens. <clears throat> uh, after you get your chickens, I'm gonna go into just a little bit of care for them. Uh, you know, go on to Murray McMurray, go on to Jinx, go on to whoever it is that you're gonna order your chicks from, get the catalog, research them, find out what breeds you want to get and go for it, just do it. Chickens are the gateway. They're the groundbreaker, if you will, to the homestead. Um, they're the gateway to homesteading. They're the gateway to this farm life. They're a way for you to, to basically, you know, once you get a chicken, before you know it, you're going to want a goat or a cow or a donkey or, you know, it, they are a great gateway. They take care of your food scraps. They provide you with food, both in meat and in eggs. They're very low maintenance. Um, so the care of your chickens, number one thing is fresh water. Many, many people do not heed this, and that is why their chickens are sick. Chickens will dirty their water. You can take a, I like to use just a, um, like a garden edging block or a garden stepping stone block. You know, you can get them at Home Depot or Lowe's or, um, and you can get them, you know, one and a half inches, you can get them four inches. Um, some people even use cinder blocks for their bigger chickens. Uh, I tend to have a lot of different, you know, sizes. So I use, uh, usually I use a four inch block. 
um, and put your chicken water on top of that. And that keeps them from kicking all of the bedding and the poo and the whatever into their, their water. Um, so just elevate their water a little bit, or you can even hang it from the ceiling of your chicken coop if that works for you. Uh, but fresh water, fresh water is a huge deal. Um, I change my chicken water out almost daily, if not every day. My rule of thumb is, is if I can see the bottom of the, um, the bowl or the, you know, hanging waterer and there is no algae, then I don't have to clean it. But if I see any green and if I see any gook or muck in it, it's getting changed out. It's getting scrubbed. So fresh water, number one. Number two, a clean environment. Uh, deep bed in the winter months when you cannot get in there and get it cleaned. If you're, you know, in Oregon, we dealt with that. It was hard. Things were frozen. It was hard to get in there and and get their, their coops cleaned. So what I started doing is I started deep bedding my chickens to where if I couldn't get in there for months at a time that they they were not standing on their own feces, that they would turn that bedding and they had enough of it to turn it over to where there was no smell, it wasn't dirty. Um, so keeping your, your, your chicken coop clean, uh, the next thing would be Obviously, food, a good quality feed for your chickens is important. Sorry, the dogs just hit the table. Um, the higher quality of feed that you feed your chickens, the harder and better your chickens are gonna work for you. So I'm not gonna get into, you know, naming brands and all of that number one because I don't know what my brands are going to be here for my chickens because I don't have my chickens yet. I'm doing my research on that. Uh, the brands here in Arkansas are much different than they are in Oregon. I bought from a local supplier in Oregon and so I'm going to have to find me a local supplier here. So um, just know that you know give them what you can afford. Nobody's judging you. Uh, if you can't afford the most expensive brand of chicken feed. Um, we're not definitely not judging you here. And uh, my chickens get almost all of my scraps. The only time that my chickens don't get my scraps, my kitchen scraps from my house, uh, is during the season that we're raising out the hogs. And then the hogs get chicken scraps more so than the chickens do. But my chickens get almost all of my scraps, turn it into compost, and then that compost goes to the compost pile when it gets aged and turned in. And then six or so months later, it goes on to the garden. Excuse me. So uh, high quality or the best quality of feed that you can afford for your chickens is important. You know, pest control. My pest control is diatomaceous earth. Uh, I also, for the health of my, well, with diatomaceous earth, we'll do that first. I generally, once every three months, will sprinkle their entire coop with diatomaceous earth. You can sprinkle it on the food. And you, you know, if you notice that your chickens maybe aren't feeling well, or maybe you've you know, diagnose them online by yourself and think that maybe they may be wormy, um, then you can sprinkle diatomaceous earth on their food. I don't do that unless I feel it's absolutely necessary. Uh, sprinkle it in their nest boxes. Uh, and also you can go down the rabbit hole of using herbs, nest box herbs is what they're called. I'm a big believer in them. Uh, there's a lot of different things in the mixes. I don't mix them myself. I usually buy them from a nice, wonderful lady that makes them, um, which reminds me, I need to call her. She's in Oregon. I need her to send me some. Um, but you can usually find them, and it looks, it literally looks kind of like a bag of potpourri or potpourri. Um, and you sprinkle that in your nest boxes. Not only does it smell nice, but it also deters the bugs. Um, that is one thing that I'm going to be contending with a lot more here in Arkansas than I ever did in Oregon. So 
I'm doing my research on the things that I'm going to be dealing with here. And if my diatomaceous earth does not work, how do I go about naturally treating that? On top of that, for general chicken health, I add for my, you know, for my entire coop, which usually I have a one gallon water, let's say. Um, sometimes I'll have more than that. But in general, I will add a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar to their water every time I refill their water. So I have apple cider vinegar sitting all over the barn, the property, it's, it's everywhere. All of my animals get it. I drink it every morning. I am a big apple cider vinegar believer. Some people aren't, and that's okay. You do you, boo. Uh, kelp. Kelp is another thing. It's super expensive, but it goes a long ways. All of my animals are on kelp, my horse included. Um, my dogs get it. My horse gets it. Uh, chickens, pigs, uh, I have not started my calves on it yet. I haven't done that research yet, but I believe my calves will go on it. Uh, kelp is a huge immunity booster. Um, it's really, really good for red blood cells. It's really, really good for, um, you know, fighting viruses. It's really good for upper respiratory problems. So kelp is just a really good natural thing I buy it in the 40 or 50 pound bag and it, it you know it's one of those things where it kind of hurts a little bit that feed store run but it lasts well I haven't bought a new bag of kelp in eight months so it lasts a long time um, basically I think that that's I think that's pretty much all of the simple answers, you know, that I that I can come up with off the top of my head. I wasn't planning on going into this much depth. Um, and again, I'm not an expert, but you know, if you guys have any questions about chickens, then drop them in the comments. Um, if you have any uh, tips or tricks that have worked for you, drop them in the comments. The comments is a really beautiful place for platforms like mine where I'm trying to, to surround myself with a community of people that are doing the same thing, or maybe even just bits of part and pieces and parts of my life. You know, some people are just canners and they don't have farms. Um, some people are just chicken people. Some people are just chicken and garden people. Some people are cow people. Some people are just dog people. Um, so what I love about the comment section um, on channels like mine is that if you drop down in the comments a tip and trick, you're not just going to affect me with your tips and your tricks. You're going to affect everybody else in the comments. So please use that space to share your knowledge and create a sense of community to where we're all helping each other. If you guys, um, like I said, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. I will try my very best to get to all of you and answer all of your questions as to the best of my ability. If I don't know, I'm gonna tell you I don't know. Um, and we can research it together. <laughs> uh, if you enjoy my content, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel and share these videos if you have anybody that you think might benefit from them. So the whole purpose of them is to help people out and inspire them to do the things that I'm doing. So I'm sorry I didn't have any chickens, alive chickens to show you. I'm not gonna have any chickens to show you for quite some time, but I am gonna have chicks here in less than a month. So. Uh, keep watching for them, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Yours truly.